Welcome to the Full Effects Unfiltered, this edition with JP Morgan. It's two weeks since the seventh annual JP Morgan e trading edit was published, and I'm delighted to be joined by Scott Wacker, who's head of eFix Sales here at the bank, and Kelvin Hebben, who is head of G10 Spot Trading. Scott, I'd like to start with you if I can. What are your key takeaways from this year's edit? So I think, first of all, uh, given that this is the seventh year that we've done this, it seems to be gaining a lot of momentum. We had about three times as many uh, participants in the survey, so well over 800 professional traders. And some of the key takeaways were, first of all, 100% felt that electronic trading was gonna increase uh, this year over last year. Second of all, um, there was sort of a, a shift away from liquidity availability as the biggest concern and more towards volatility. And I think that's actually quite positive because uh, if they are less worried about liquidity availability, it sort of underscores the robustness of the markets. Yep. The other, um, the other major takeaway for me was uh, we asked them what the major technology uh, was for them in terms of the next few years. And in the past, it's always been some something like mobile apps, et cetera. But this year, for the first time, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence topped the, uh, the charts in terms of major technology. So, Kelvin, 2022 was a different year in FX probably for the first time in the edit's history, in that we had both volatility, sustained volatility, and a trend. From a trader's perspective, what were your key takeaways about how the market coped? I think, well, I think what's interesting is, is we had a number of episodic events, which, you know, many of us won't see again in our lifetimes. You know, we had, you know, war on the doorstep of Europe. Uh, we had a meltdown in UK politics and yes. the associated volatility in cable. Um, and, you know, we had we had the sort of the aftermath of the pandemic and the uh, supply chain issues, which have which have obviously caused, you know, a severe spike in inflation. And, you know, hence inflation is obviously at the at the forefront of people's minds. If, yeah. you, if you look at the survey results. So I think what's interesting is that the fact that the markets were volatile, but at no point were they out of control in terms of liquidity. Um, so, you know, certainly the, mon the market has functioned, you know, fairly well. Um, the the sort of the, um, the 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 more prevalent electronic trading hasn't impacted the way markets are functioning. So it's not like you could say that that human you know you need more human participation to to allow the markets to function. So so certainly from that perspective, I think you know markets have been very efficient and you know and people have actually been able to trade what they need to trade. As we move on into into this year, certainly. The volatility question mark is is one that is uh, you know the most concern, and, and essentially, central banks have been providers of liquidity for a number of years and dampen volatility, and now we're we're in a position where markets are more worried about recession possibilities and inflation possibilities, and therefore that support from central banks has been removed, and therefore you know that's why I think volatility has risen to the top in terms of in terms of primary concerns. Uh, and the macro drivers are interested, aren't they? I mean, the yeah, markets haven't been driven by macro factors for quite some time, really, have they? No, exactly. Like, you know, essentially, um, you know, it's been a race to the bottom in terms of policy for a number of years. FX volatility has been low in general since the financial crisis, um, culminating in the period sort of 17 to 19, where, you know, vols were, euro dollar vols were, were on a three handle. Uh, at some stages. So, yeah, certainly volatility is back, interest is back, and, you know, it certainly, it certainly um, you know, led to a lot more interest in, in terms of trading effects in general. Yeah. Scott, the surveys a bit, or the edit, is, is about much more than just FX. Even I will acknowledge there are other asset classes out there, um, allegedly. What did you see in fixed income, credit, etc., that you found, and commodities that you found really interesting? So, W w two things, really. I think um, one of the big things was what we asked a question about um, our traders' view in terms of the amount of activity they'll they expect to be in terms of trading um, uh, crypto and uh, and digital coins. And uh, what was interesting about the survey is we saw that a huge percentage of those uh, traders had really no interest or didn't see themselves trading. Uh, digital coin uh, or cryptocurrencies in the next few years. Yeah. They did think vol volumes would grow, but uh, certainly that seemed to be off the radar screen uh, for the first time in a while. 
I think uh, also there's a view that uh, a lot of the advances we've seen in some of the more uh, advanced electronic uh, asset classes, uh, we anticipate to see the same thing in areas such as rates, credits, commodities, and, fu and, and foreign exchange options, for instance. What are the challenges in those markets? So yeah, you mentioned 100% of people expect to increase electronic trading. What are the challenges in you know, credit rates and commodities to actually achieve that? So I think one of the biggest challenges is, is really data, right? So the availability of tick data, uh, live tick data. You know, essentially, the more a market becomes electronified, the more um, pieces of information you have about where the market's traded. Some of that, I think, is a function of trading protocols. So an RFQ market, you know, which is sort of like trading, you know, sort of by appointment almost, is very different to um, responding to live streaming prices. Now, those protocols are going to take a while to shift because underneath that, you need also quite a bit of development technology. So you need the growth of API and direct connectivity. You need to have um, clients who have the interfaces to be able to interact with, um, with, with direct connectivity. So we're seeing sort of an, an evolution, right? So on the trading side, algorithmic trading in other asset classes continues to build and grow. We're able to respond much more quickly uh, and algorithmically to requests. And then the real question is, does market structure shift to a point where you're seeing a lot more trading, albeit in small notionals, but a lot more trading, which then gives you more data. The more data you have gives you a better idea where the market is at any given time, which then, of course, leads you to the ability to build algorithmic order capabilities, et cetera. So it's, um, it, it's a process. I, I think we know what the path looks like. Uh, I think the question is, you know, how quickly will uh, the tools become available and how quickly will um, a number of the traders embrace technological advances? Yeah. And I guess, I mean, obviously, You've seen this, we've seen this in FX, having to embrace technology. Do you actually think, Kelvin, that these asset classes will lean into FX for the experience? Um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, FX has been at the forefront of, of the move towards E. And therefore, yeah, by, by definition, people will, will look to replicate that model in other asset classes. Now, clearly, FX is different in terms of certain characteristics, in terms of liquidity, um, in terms of transparency that maybe you don't get in, in other asset classes, but you know, certainly the model has worked. Um, you know, obviously more people want to trade electronically yeah. in FX even from here. Um, and so therefore I think that, you know, that um, other asset classes will take take their lead from from a foreign exchange uh, perspective. We're certainly seeing that internally. We're looking to broaden our, our, um, our, our offerings across asset classes and people are leaning on our expertise to, to help drive that. You mentioned electronic trading, Scott, in the survey, 100% of people expected to increase. What was interesting to me was that most of that growth was in asset classes outside of FX, which I guess reflects the mature nature of FX. But that to me was quite interesting. How's that going to happen? Yeah, so, so that, that was interesting. And, and I guess when we look at you know, the percentage of our FX business that's already electronic, you know, we're sort of well north of 90% in terms of trade tickets. Um, obviously, the larger tickets are handled differently than the electronic, but one of the things you do see when you go electronic is trades tend to get smaller, but you get a lot more of them. So electronification is already very, very high in FX. So when we ask the question about more electronification or more activity, absolutely. Uh, and it was really across the board. Commodities, FX options, credit, i.e. corporate bonds, and rates. Um, and if you think about sort of what's required for that to happen, it's really about generating more data, right? Yeah. And, and, and the, more, the more you have electronic trading, the more data points you get. And what's really interesting too is it's a little bit about protocols as well. So if you think about where we are in FX and to some degree in sort of precious metals and base metals and commodities where we're sort of generally trading on sort of live streaming prices, those protocols are not prevalent in the other asset classes. You know, we tend to, 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 to focus on RFQ, um, but then the question is, how do you respond to the RFQs? And electronification is really about efficiency, right? So if we see more trades, smaller notionals, we need to reply and respond to those. If we can do so algorithmically, hence developing algorithmic trading, the ability to automatically respond, uh, negotiate, trade, confirm, and book trades, it allows our broader business to focus on, let's say, higher notional trades. But 
as that happens, you know, as you are able to provide more uh, stream pricing or responses to RFQs, then the question is really, well, can clients digest and interact on a live streaming basis? That requires API development, that requires EMSs, that also requires more than one provider to be offering this service. Yeah. Because if you're looking to trade and you need to trade with at least three counterparts, let's say, or you want to know where the market is, again, without streaming data, you don't actually know where it is until you ask an RFQ. But if you can get multiple stream uh, stream prices, then you know where it is before you trade. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a chicken and the egg, but we are seeing developments, right? So if I go across the asset classes uh, in commodities, for instance, um, a lot of the commodity uh, businesses are already live streaming. Uh, we've just rolled out our first um, uh, commodity index algo. In rates, uh, we're live streaming in U.S. Treasuries, ONS, OFFS, OLDS, CURS, FLIES, et cetera. We have order uh, and we have algos there. We're looking to do the same thing across the other major um, uh, rates products, so Eurogovies, GILDs, et cetera. And what's really interesting is how all this technology is starting to um, become more prevalent in the, in the corporate bond or the credit space. And so the advance is there, you know, partly with some, some, some input, or I should say a lot of input from non-bank market makers. We're starting to look at how we can pull together liquidity, not just from an internal franchise perspective, i.e. all the clients that we trade with at JP Morgan, but also what's happening in the equity market. So the ETF um, create redeem process adds a ton of liquidity if we combine that with franchise liquidity across commodities, rates, and credit, you start to create more data, more liquidity. Yeah. And, uh, and I think all those things are sort of moving in, 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 in sort of a well-known direction. It's just a que question of how quickly the other market makers are adopting those technologies and how quickly the clients can incorporate it into their trading activities. It's one of those occasions where it effectively we need to lead the clients to electronic trading rather than actually wait for the demand. So our view always has been, you know, we need to move forward uh, in any way that could provide, let's say, better market participation by our clients. You know, we're always looking to grow market share. And if market share is an ambition, then the question is, how do you get market share? Yeah. Well, you get market share by showing better prices, showing quicker prices. You can only do that through technology. Yeah. And if we're the first to compress, we have a better shot of gaining more market share. Kelvin, Scott spoke there about efficiency. One of the findings I've noticed has been picked up quite broadly is the AI and machine learning aspect. I think it was the number one uh, technology likely to be prevalent in over the coming years. Am I right in thinking though, it's more about actually AI and machine learning helping the process rather than the trading decision making? Um, yeah, I think you're right there. I mean, in terms of actually decision making, especially as volatility in markets goes up, uh, I think the ability of AI to replace humans, you know, across across a broad number of processes, is is quite limited. So I think it's more on on the pricing, provision of liquidity, and efficiency efficiency of trading ele electronically that that AI that AI will help. And um, you know, I think. What it does for us is it, is it improves our pricing, it improves our internalization rates. The more we learn about how clients trade, um, about what pricing we, we, we have on, on, on a number of uh, variety of platforms, what it helps us to do is provide the best price to the you know, best price to the individual client. And, and you know, and that's across numerous um, client sectors that we have. Essentially, Internalization of our franchise remains very high, and is, is why we sort of are the market leader in in, in ENFX. And uh, I think AI will contrib contribute to that um, as we as we move forward. Yeah, yeah. But Scott, I think you have a little a minor bee in your bonnet about AI and machine learning. You see it more as machine learning maybe becoming more influential. Yeah, I mean, as Kelvin said, it's 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 really about um, improving our processes. Um, and I know there's sometimes, you know, a bit of concern when we use the term artificial intelligence, i.e. we're replacing human beings. That's a very difficult thing to achieve. You know, JP Morgan has an artificial intelligence center of excellence. And, you know, we are trying to figure out how to incorporate true, like, sentient decision making into 
bank processes. But when it comes to trading, we have to control very much how we get to outcomes. Yeah. So just to give you an example of where we use machine learning to sort of benefit uh, our clients uh, and maybe our trading protocols. So if you think about FX, and let's just go to FX, like we trade with thousands and thousands of clients, individual unique clients on a daily basis. Uh, average daily volumes, you know, sometimes, you know, spike over a hundred billion dollars a day just at JP Morgan. To digest that kind of information and to make sure that we're pricing every trade appropriately, you have to embrace technology. And so what we do is we look very much at how clients use the liquidity that we provide electronically. And what I mean by that is different traders will use it for hedging, some will use it for trading, some will build models around it, et cetera. But we've discovered that the, the, the trading behavior of each counterpart has a different impact on market, right? And we have to price each client appropriately to make sure that we're charging the absolute correct amount of risk spread to cover the trade. So if the markouts are high, we need to charge more. And if the markouts are low, we need to charge less. So if we can do that systematically by constantly testing the markouts of trades and then adjusting pricing accordingly, we can price every single entity correctly. And that has a massive positive halo effect for everyone in the franchise, both those that have bigger markouts and those that don't. Because what we're doing is we're not overcharging where we don't need to overcharge, and we can tighten up as much as we can on those that don't have markout. And so what we've been able to do through using machine learning is we've been able to tighten our spreads across the board. I think uh, in 2022, we were able to tighten spreads by about you know 0.2%, um, and also gain market share of about 2%. Mm. So it, it works, but it's not about replacing individuals. It's just being able to deal with you know, huge amounts of activity in an efficient manner, pricing things correctly. Yeah. So, Kelvin, obviously, you know, with all due respect to the other asset classes that Scott's responsible for, this isn't, I'm an FX person. This is an FX sort of a, a publication. One simple question, is FX back? Well, I think, um, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, maybe it just went to sleep for a while, you know, certainly success breeds success. And from a trading perspective, people made money in macro generally in the last 12 months and specifically in FX where, you, as, you, as you mentioned earlier, there was a trend. So, you know, certainly, you know, the allocation to FX from a macro perspective, if you look at the hedge funds sector uh, specifically, you know, is, is probably, you know, faster and higher now than, than it has been for quite some time. Um, but for also, you know, given FX is moving, you know, um, from a sort of asset management, uh, corporate sort of angle, certainly hedging, uh, you know, hedging FX risks, you know, is, is certainly at the forefront of, of more people's minds. Um, you, you see it in, in a number of, uh, in a number of earnings reports last year that the dollar movements in general were, you know, very impactful on, yeah. on, on total revenues. So certainly from a speculative Plus a hedging perspective, FX is certainly back. And so, you know, at the end of the day, policies, uh, central bank policy was was pretty much zero everywhere. And now suddenly we have a return of yield. And, you know, uh, you know um, at the end of the day, we've had long careers in this industry and, and we've seen inflation before, but certainly a lot of market participants have, haven't. So, you know, certainly I'm pretty constructive on, on, the, on the coming years for FX in general. Yeah. And Scott, I mean... Kelvin raises one good point there, just to close out with you. Clients have d different interests in different markets, but FX kind of knits them together, doesn't it? If the dollar moves, most of your clients are going to be affected in one way or the other. Absolutely. I mean, FX, you know, across the entire electronic suite is, is the biggest by far, yeah. both in terms of notional, but also in terms of, you know, the, the, the revenues that we generate. We're looking to use what we learn in FX into other asset classes, but FX has always been the pressure valve um, it's usually the quickest to react when something happens <coughs> in the macro markets. It's extremely liquid. Uh, and, you know, based on some of the stats I quoted earlier in terms of number of clients, notional volumes per day, um, and, 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 you know, the, the, the trading protocols, it's naturally that, that, um, that pressure valve because yeah. it's always there. It's up and running. It's electronic. Um, but I do, I, but but I do believe that we're going to see, you know, massive um, uh, growth on the electronic side um, in the other asset classes. Yeah. yeah, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll be back with a new edition soon.